Um, all right, so uh, this is my uh, this is my presentation. The title is, as you can see, a rip of of famous Woody Allen's movie. Uh, it's a very good title uh, if you don't know how to create one, and I didn't at the time because it's very it's a, it's a very powerful cultural template. To be honest, everyone knows about it. The original word had sex within, but you can exchange it with anything else, and it will work. So if you are in a dire need of a title, just use this one. Uh, I'm Martin Rzynicki, I work at Iterators. Uh, we are a Warsaw company and we are hiring. <laughs> aren't we? Probably. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, well, the, the one good recommendation why you should probably take a stab at, at our uh, recruitment process is that we actually use this stuff. We do a lot of hardcore functional programming, so we want you to be creative. So if, you're, if you want to try your your hardcore functional programming skills, then we'll welcome you with open arms. All right, so pitch aside, the today's talk is about free moments. Uh, that's, a, that's been a quite popular topic for a while. It probably started with Rudolf Bjarsson and, uh, and his blog, and then gained a lot of traction, uh, so probably you heard about it. In this part, I just want to quickly explain what, what free is, if you don't know it. If you do, maybe you can learn something new, so just please listen as well. So uh, the best definition I came up with is that free is a way to pack a computation into a data structure. If you think in terms of interpreter pattern, probably you're not very far away from what the free really is. It's a, it's a kind of a recap of of interpreter pattern, but a bit power, a bit more powerful, and a bit more generalized. But uh, basically, it's uh, it, it gives you a way to store your computation in abstract terms as a data structure, which, as you may think, is uh, you may think about why it's important because uh, it decouples interpretation of computation, its semantics, with uh, actual well storage, actual processing of, of computation. And it's called free because you, uh, it's kind of complicated, but it's free because you can get it for any higher kind of type. There are no strings attached. The only thing you, you need for this is uh, any higher kind of type. Um, it works, if you are mathematically inclined, it works because of a thing called uh, Yone Dilemma, or its counterpart called Koyone Dilemma. Uh, so I'm not going to talk about it sufficient to uh, to understand that it works only because of uh, uh, only because of any higher kind of type. But uh, if you want to look it up, just please do. It's a it's a nice a nice mathematical uh, mathematical riddle. Um, well, this is free in terms of signature, in terms of type signature, as as it would be written in Scala. So uh, as I said before, the whole type free with higher kind of type and something, we'll get to that, is a description of program. You may think of it as uh, still clinging to your, to your intuition of interpreter pattern, you may think of it as a program, actually. A program that is expressed in abstract semantics, in abstract, so to say, instructions that uh, for now are not yet interpreted, but are stored in, uh, in this thing, which is free. And uh, this higher kind of type I was talking about a, a second before is a algebra, mathematically speaking, but we may think of it as a DSL, as a domain specific language, as a set of instructions that program, that this program uh, will uh, be operating on. And the A is just a type of the value that's, that will be produced when the interpretation has been finished. Um, so, well, when it's packed into structure, you may uh, want to do a lot of things with it. Uh, first of all, the algebra is kind of a set of operations uh, that you express semantics with. And it's, uh, it's really non-restricted. Uh, you may have algebra of, I don't know, logging, operating on users, uh, what, whatever you want. You name it, just pack it into a type and uh, create an, an algebra, an algebraic data type out of it, and you're free to go. 
And well, as I said, A is the value that will be produced after the interpretation, after this structure uh, has been interpreted. And in, in this way, we can model a program as a, uh, as a sequence of operations where the semantics lies. And the free is just a holder of something that will be uh, of combination of these, uh, of these operations that will be executed. So as I said before, it's decoupled. The semantics, the denotational semantics of, uh, of program are decoupled from, uh, from its storage and its interpretations, which is a good property actually, because well, half of programming is about decoupling things. So uh, we kind of get it for free, pun intended, from free monad. Mm. And such descriptions can be, well, you name it, can be interpreted to get a value uh, out of the execution, can be introspected. You may actually inspect what's within and do some transformations to it, and, well, transform. If that's not, uh, if that's not, is, is the code visible? All right, uh, so I don't know how to actually fix it if it's not right now, so <laughs> <laughs> take my words for what's, it, what's within. Um, yeah, so if, if, what I said, uh, if what I said has sounded abstract to you, then maybe, maybe the implementation, as it's, as it's found in Cat's library, will make, it, uh, will make it clear. So free is just a structure, it's an, it's an uh, abstract class. It has it's itself an algebraic data type. It's free. Uh, it has free uh, members. <coughs> One is called pure, and it's used for as the comments. I just copied it from from uh, uh, with comments uh, from cat. So pure is for holding values. Think constants in terms of program. Uh, in, in terms of program analogy. Uh, suspend is what holds an instruction. Uh, it holds a element of our algebra. And GoSub, uh, GoSub is a really awkward name, and actually it's been renamed in the in the newest version of CAT. is okay. called FlatMap. And uh, the name FlatMap is is a good name because when you see when you look at the, uh, at the signature, you see that it kind of resembles FlatMap. So it's for binding. Uh, pures and suspense and other gossips, so it's for gluing the whole structure together. Gossip is a name, a bit of like a startup from from Bay Area. It doesn't really, I guess, mean anything. So, so just call it, just think of it as flat map. And uh, I'm I'm gonna show you in a brief example. That's an example copied from um, Cat tutorial, I guess. Uh, what these pure suspense and uh, whatnot and gossips are used for. Uh, so it's very, very small, very few examples. So let's say we have a key value store. That's our algebra I was talking about. So this algebra has uh, abstract instructions, put, get, delete. That's what we, we imagine uh, should be in the key value store. Uh, so this is, our, this is our semantics. We have no, uh, for now, we have no means of saying how these are executed. And we do not really want to uh, know how these are executed. We just uh, we just carry some semantics. The semantics are hidden in the name and, well, a bit in a signature. So, yeah, if you just imagine key value store, these are the operations you really want or need to have to implement a key value store. That's it. Uh, and, well, where, uh, where these pure suspense and so on and so on, uh, where are they used? So. If I want to return a value, as simple as that, think constant. Say I wanna, I wanna write a phony get, which just returns none every time, then I would, I would have used pure constructor to create a pure holder. It just holds a value. It's a terminal element in, in the algebra. It's just a, sim just a single value, a constant value. If I want, to execute an instruction in my language, uh, well, in in uh, in this example, get, uh, I'm lifting it to uh, to a free, and this creates a suspend for me. So I'm just holding a single instruction, 
and I can flat map these to create a more complicated program. And then I will create a tree-like structure of go subs or flat maps. Judging by your looks, you don't really see what's what's in these code books, right? It's hard to see. Well, anyways. <laughs> <laughs> anyways, uh, well, so pure are for values. <laughs> I just I'm just gonna recap it once again. So. So we'll have a uh, we'll have a hold of it. Uh, so pures are for values, suspends are for instructions, and goes ups are, are the meaning of gluing it into a tree-like structures that that will be traversed or what whatnot. What happens at the end? You yield glue? Uh, yep, I'm yielding a unit because this one returns a unit, so I need to produce a unit. No other way around. It. Oh yeah, because uh, so we actually see the code. That's good. Uh, Anyway, so uh, uh, update uh, update first tries to get the value, and if this value is something, uh, then it will execute a put operation, either transforming it by a function or returning, uh, which will return the unit or uh, returning unit straight away if the value is not found. So, and that's the other example of what you uh, what you need pure for. Right. Go back. Uh, All okay, right. So I understand the unit in pure, but the yield unit, mm -hmm. that sh does the full comprehension really have the, the desired uh, type? Uh, key boss, uh, yes, it does. Uh, yes, it does. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm sure it does because I just copied it, but uh, if you want a unit, so you uh, whatever comes out of it, you map it to unit. Because this yield is transformed to map, right? When you desugar this uh, this full comprehension, this will turn as a as a final map, right, on it. So you'll just map whatever comes out of out of the full comprehension into unit, which will get you a unit you want. Right. Yeah. Um. So uh, you know, uh, just to give some some flash to to what I said. So programs can be introspected one step at a time. Yes, that's that's pretty obvious because if you hold the structure of of some elements, you can just uh, do kind of visitor pattern and uh, drill it down and uh, pattern matching is, is kind of a form of visitor pattern. So you can pattern match on it and then introspect it. So that's checked. Now, uh, programs can be interpreted and uh, this is really a, a bread and butter of all this because this, that's the only meaning of, that's the only way to, of getting a value out of structure we have. And for this we need an interpreter, which is the third element of, uh, of all these free, of all these things that, that go with free. We call this interpreter a natural transformation, and that's an, uh, well, that's a trait that has uh, an apply method, which can take anything out of higher kind of type S and turn it into higher kind of type M. That's it. And so just treat it as a generalized function that operates, that uh, changes, kind of changes domain. And well, no matter the implementation, actually it's like this, but once we got a monad, we can use its pure and its flat map and corresponding um, elements of free to create a value in this monad, so uh, or as my predecessor said, in a context, which is a good interpretation as well. So, in this way, you can take the stored computation and actually reify it to create a value in a context. And this context can be any monad. There are no, as you, as you see, there are no limitations uh, as of to what it can be. It can be a future. It can be a um, I don't know option. Maybe it doesn't make sense, but. It can be XOR, it can be a DBIO, as in our own code, and so on, so on. As long as you have monad, you can take the structure and turn it into value by executing all these computations. And probably the most important part of it, is, if you can see that, I hope you can, uh, is uh, this one. So once I have my, my instruction in my language, I can actually interpret it here. So I can take this, uh, I can write an interpreter for it, I can take this and create uh, an effect, something that, uh, something that carries out the semantics coded in, 
uh, coded in the in the instruction in our algebra. So, yep. So we can interpret them. The other thing, uh, it's maybe only theoretically interesting, but uh, you can kind of recompile it into another language. And so on. Uh, this is not maybe really very important, but uh, anyway, if you have a program in one algebra, you can naturally create a program in another algebra for it. So that's, that's how you can transform programs. So uh, as you can see, you have a pretty general structure, let's say a language. Uh, which we can, well, introspect and so on, so on, interpret and so on, so on. We have interpreter and we have semantics. So we decoupled everything that matters in a computation. So computation is about taking values and doing something meaningful with them, producing a result. So we just generalized everything out of it and decoupled into three elements. Into structure itself, into interpreter that carries out the semantics and code within the structure, and, uh, well, and yeah, holding the holding the structure together, gluing it, binding it, so to say. Not only that, but we can compose algebra. So we have two languages. Uh, if we have two languages, then we can create a kind of a super language. So a language which is a combination of these two, which creates, uh, which has a uh, uh, which has instructions or elements from one language and the other language. We do it by, uh, by encoding these, these languages into a, something called coproduct, which is a generali generalization of either and or XOR. Uh, and we can always create a super free. <coughs> so it's a free that can, uh, that can hold programs in two languages by construct like this. Not really important, but inject can always be constructed for coproduct. So, because if we have two languages, we can always mark them as the left and right, right? So, if we have a program in one language and a program in the other language, we can always create a, a super tree being a combination of these two, in which we just mark which language the instruction is from. Is it left or right? Left or right? Left or right? And in this way, we can create a one big structure of programs being written or created in uh, two separate languages. So th this is the, the, the kind of a composition that, that uh, we can have at our disposal. Uh, we can always, oh yeah. So this is a thing that, uh, that is called a vertical composition. It's a composition of interpreters. Interpreters compose as well. Everything composes in a free world. Because if you, if you can interpret two languages, F and G, into some common language H, then you can as well, and probably that's a, that's a very obvious, you can interpret a coproduct of these languages. So that's a vertical composition. So if I have, and this, the operator for, uh, the operator for um, the combinator, probably I should say, for this is called OR. So if I have one interpreter and the other interpreter, I can OR them together to create an interpreter for the super algebra being a uh, superposition of these two, al of these two uh, subsequent al algebras. And I can also compose them horizontally. So it's of a, it is an end then and compose. Because natural transformations, as I said, are written in, uh, in terms of apply, which is a bit of a generalized apply, but still it's apply. So we can, uh, we can well, compose them as we, as we would have composed functions. So we have, well, to recap this, we have a structure, interpreter, and a language in which we describe programs, computations of any kind, in any domain we can possibly imagine. We can compose them, well, by gluing them together, or, uh, well, vertically, so to speak, or horizontally. And we have a monad. Our, well, say our tamed monad, because we all know what monad is. So, because free is a monad, and that's the proof of it. If you don't see it, just you know, never mind it, because uh, it, it's just a proof. We don't want uh, you know to, to really to uh, think about it a lot. So, if it's a monad, we can uh, kind of uh, use monad transformers on it, and by by doing this, we'll teach our programs to do uh, for free, basically, because we don't need any 
an implementation on our own, we can teach our programs to do various tricks. We can teach them to throw exceptions. Well, it's a quote-unquote ex exceptions because these are not really exceptions like in stuck and winding exceptions. These are exceptions in terms of functional exceptions which are encoded by XOR transformer. So we can just create a programs that, uh, that we force to bail out on the first error. So it's like a <coughs> throw in imperative language. Uh, we can teach our programs to do logging and it's a functional logging style, not a, a you know, write to file style by, uh, by enriching them with writer T and so on and so on. We can, uh, we can enrich them with reader T to uh, have some kind of an external environment or configuration or whatnot that we can pass to our program and that our program can read. We don't have to pass it through. So we have language. We have a structure holding programs in this language. We have interpreters and we have means to enrich the execution model. If you think in terms of, I don't know, a uh, virtual machine, then we can, we can specify some additional semantics to our execution, like bailing out, logging, uh, whatnot, reading environment. And every, each and every transformer that you might come up with is available. Uh, so if you kind of you know, wrap your free into a, I don't know, an option T, you'll get a program that will bail out on first value that cannot be produced, and so on, so on, so on. Well, this, because it's a model, right? So uh, what suffices to, uh, you know, to, to have the semantics is only limited by type of value, right? So a program that, um, uh, that will be uh, wrapped into XORT will have to return XORs, and a um, program that will be uh, wrapped into writer will need to return pair of some monoids plus values and so on, so on. But uh, apart from that, apart from that, you can attach any additional semantics, any monadic computation, any monadic context or computation to uh, to your programs. So we have pretty generic and non-restrictive ways of by uh, by just using free of um, writing computations, right? Is that uh, I know clear? It is all right. And that's kind of a bold statement, I guess. And some of my colleagues told me that this statement is too bold. But I, I really believe that in modern functional programming, that's probably the way to go. To kind of you know shrug off all this imperative. What's that? <laughs> uh, where was I? Ah, all right. Um, so yeah, uh, my bold statement just kind of a puff and smoke. <laughs> I was trying to make a bold statement, and then it's not really bold anymore. So let me start again. So I want to make a bold statement uh, that in modern functional programming, what we really want to what I do is to shrug off, as I said, this, this imperative baggage. And first of all, do not write programs, but just write the descriptions of programs, and these descriptions can then be uh, well executed in any way we want. Before the execution, they can be transformed, introspected, and whatnot. But this way, we generate a perfect decoupling between semantics of program and its execution. We're just generating a good thing. And we can deconstruct by, by composing algebras or, or uh, instances of free, we can decompose a program, a big program especially, into layers. And all these layers will be separate because uh, uh, they can be separate, right? Because uh, as we saw, we have a means of composing them into bigger structures, but the structures itself can be local. The language itself can be local. They don't have to know about each other because if we can interpret f and g into some common age, then we can uh, interpret the coproduct and so on, so on, so on. But this way we can deconstruct everything perfectly into layers, which will represent different concepts. And by just by the sound of it, it sounds good, right? We want to decompose things into, we want a separation of concerns, simply speaking. And 
at the end, when we have a big descriptions packed into nice structures and they are transformed and respected, these all layers are compiled into something, into the result, into the effect we want. Be it a future or um, an XOR, DBIO, and whatnot, but these are all separate concerns. So basically, that's what uh, that's what free gives us or enables us to do uh, by by um, by its scanning, you know, construct. Um, all right. Uh, before I before I, I I go through this point, it's kind of obvious uh, what free is. It's kind of easy to imagine what free is and what it does, but it might not be very easy to embed it into a big application where we have uh, kind of a traditional layers of, of software decomposition. We are used to, um, to decompose programs into HTTP layer, a, a service layer of, a kind, of some kind, where well, the business logic usually lies and the services are are interconnected and so on, so on. And, uh, you know, some DB repositories below all this. So these are the traditional levels or layers of, of software decomposition, where in this picture, free lies. So can we use a common structure that all generations of programmers have been used to? Can we use them with this relatively new thing? And can they seamlessly uh, be stitched or combined? And if the answer is yes, uh, what was the possible, what's the possible or was the best way to do it? Uh, I'm not sure what's the best way to do it, uh, but uh, we have some ideas that I, I want to share with you. First, um, oh, and by the way, this is, uh, this is a good thing, uh, not only because it uh, it can be done or it buys us all these things that I was talking about, but uh, it's the, f the free as itself is is a good way because um, it organizes your code, so to say. You cannot easily, uh, you know, mix layers in normal code, so to say. You can mix layers, right? You can have logic in repository, or you can have, uh, I don't know, a DB access code in service layer. It's possible, and you know it might be tempting to do, or natural to do. Here with free, as you can see, these are all separated just by its definition. So even if you, by any chance, wanted to, uh, wanted to do bad things to your code, you wouldn't be able to. Or it would be so hard to do that, probably you'd bail out. Um, but still, we want probably want to keep these traditional layers because we are first of all used to it, and the other thing is that it's not bad, right? The well, vertical decomposition into HTTP layer and the service layer and so on, so on, so on is a good thing basically. Uh, so can we somehow connect them? Um, and these are, this is kind of like a recipe I, I have for this. Uh, well, it, it's been used. It's been, well, proven in my experience, so, so I'll share it with you. Um, all right, first, and there will be an example if you don't want to read all this and or don't want to hear me talking about this, there will be an, an example. I hope it will be visible. Uh, but I will, I will open it up if we're in IntelliJ to, uh, well, to present a small application that, that uses all these ideas. So first, we can start with only business logic as described by, by language, by an abstract language, uh, our algebra, our DSL, so to speak. And, well, yeah, we turn this into algebra that we will later interpret. This is a good thing because we can have a separate uh, repository of programs, so to say, which have only business logic. Business logic and only that. There is nothing else. And this business logic doesn't have any, uh, you know, any executional semantics. It's just a language that describes the logic of our of, you know, flow of our use cases 
that our code will later execute. So that's the first layer. Now, the second advice is that in parallel to building all this, we want to keep some kind of, um, well, let's call it internal level DSL to keep up with this metaphor of program that I was talking about. Because uh, what, what I mean is that, um, yeah, let's take a look at this. There, there is a lot of craft here. Or the things that are, maybe it's not craft, maybe that's a bad word. Uh, it, there, is a, there are other things that are, um, well, clouding the big picture a bit, right? Syntactic All this, yes, syntactic, yes, syntactic mess, so to say. This free dot lift f, what does it mean, right? Of course, you can learn what it means and so on, so on. It's not very hard to do. Or free dot pure, or uh, I don't know, just um, maybe dot map, or so on, so on, so on. We are kind of losing our. If we wanna, we can go this way, but we will lose our our program metaphor, which is kind of important because. You know, in this talk, I've used word program like, uh, well, say 50 times, right? It sounds important. It sounds the right thing, right metaphor for all this program, execution, instruction, and so on, so on. But suddenly we are kind of losing all this here, right? It's, it's well buried beneath all this lift apps, pures, and so on, so on. So. We want some internal DSL, internal level DSL that keeps up with this, this program metaphor. Um, I'll show some examples in a second. Well, let me go back. Whoops. Uh, so pro yeah, probably want we want to have some kind of a internal library or so on, a DSL, so to say, to uh, to hide all these all these. Um, unneeded things and expose this program metaphor. Do we want to have a method called execute instruction or call instruction or throw something, not xor.t, uh, I don't know, something or free.lift, something, because that, that's clouding our, our, our metaphor. Now, and uh, this, this, these last three points are kind of a tra how traditional layers, they describe how traditional layers fit into into, or we propose them to fit into, into a free picture. So first, when HTTP resource receives a request from the outside world, that is gonna determine by, you know, parameters uh, passed uh, by a HTTP call, you know, headers, whatnot, uh, decoded body, uh, path, and so on, so on. It will determine, or it can determine a program, a free program that we stored previously in the f in uh, probably somewhere around the first point while we're writing this this first point we we created programs or definition of programs so the HTTP resource can now choose a program to be executed right so if it's a health slash session then we can uh, we can choose or determine that uh, you know authenticate me program needs to be called and if it's a I don't know uh, user slash delete and appropriate program needs to be called. Then somehow we need to wire this layer with interpreters because having only definitions of programs buys us nothing because they by itself are static and they just describe the loading. But we, uh, we need to carry out the appropriate, uh, appropriate um, execution. So we want to wire it with interpreters for each program that needs to be executed or may need to be executed by an HTTP resource and that will naturally form a service layer for us. Well, because in, in traditional uh, setting, an HTTP resource will be calling services. And here it will be choosing the programs and passing them down to interpreters. So it kind of fits a service layer. So we can call our layer of our, well, our repository or layer of interpreters as a service layer. And after that, we'll get a result. And once this result will have been passed to us, uh, we'll get, we'll turn it into an HTTP response. So if you get a I don't know, left of something, then we'll return 404 or whatnot. Doesn't make sense. At least six, seven, <laughs> eight people think it does. All right, so I take it as a, as a yes. Uh, well, if I uh, if I were to draw it, 
I'm not very good at, at this kind of, of diagrams and, and stuff, but if I were to draw it, I would draw it like this. Behold my creation. Um, so yeah, that's basically that's basically a depict depiction of uh, of what I've just said. So HTTP player sends program to be interpreted and takes this program from some well base of programs, some uh, some repository of programs, and the service layer will call a DB repositories or whatever it needs to perform its task of interpretation, and the result will flow back. Now, of course, this stuff can be free as well. We can have this this you know this matryoshka thing going on here, but I'm not really sure if that's a good idea because well. When you call a DB, you don't probably, you don't really need a uh, abstract semantics, right? You basically know what you want to execute. In service layer, well, there is no, you know, a standard way of logging in. Well, there are some standard ways of logging in, but they can be coded differently. They can use different means of achieving the effect and so on and so on. And the same goes for, you know, you name it, uh, creating an item in data, uh, an item in some kind of a business you know, storage, uh, and so on, so on. There are no standard weights, so we need to abstract them out. But when it comes to DB, there are standard weights. When we call a DB, we just form a query, we send it, and we expect an answer. So probably, well, your mileage may vary, but probably there are no really uh, there are no gains here of abstracting, well, interaction with DB, because that's pretty standard, right? I take a query, I execute it, and um, that's it. But, well, of course, if you have something complicated going on here, then you may, you know, replicate the structure down. Yeah, um, all right, as promised, please send me the codes. I, I'm just going to show a, a small app that uses uh, some of these ideas or most of these ideas in, in action. That's a toy app, but well, uh, I guess you'll, uh, you can relate. Anyways, um, all right, okay, first, uh, because there's a funny story behind it. Well, domain has always, uh, needs to be always, you know, funny or entertaining for people to, you know, pay attention. So, the domain is like this. Uh, there is a, a place called uh, Fiddler Island. It's near, uh, near Australia. And it, it's a part of Australia. So it's down under. And, well, in this place uh, they got a wombat zoo. Well, wombat is a small creature that's uh, there's a furry creature. Probably it's a robin, right? Or something like this, but it's, it's really cute. Uh, Wombat is the right name, I guess, because they call it Wombat. They, they call it themselves Wombat. Uh, anyway, uh, well, imagine a, a cute furry animal, like uh, you know, a small cat or hamster that you really you know like and wanna uh, you wanna cuddle it and well. The thing is that this, uh, that this zoo created a job opening uh, for being a wombat cuddler. So your only responsibility in this well-paid job is to cuddle a wombat or wombats that are in this zoo. And that's your solely responsibility for the rest of your life till retirement. So, well, if you ask me, that's, that's a dream job to well, have. So... And they pay for everything. I mean, they even pay to fly you there, you know, f you know, so you can be a wombat cuddler. So that is a a dream job. I don't know. Probably, probably you're bound to agree. Well, given the jobs we have. Um, anyways, uh, so let's imagine we are writing. What are these flashes? I think I have experienced. Let's stop. So imagine we're writing application for 
uh, for this, this zoo to process uh, you know, job applications from prospective Wombot cuddlers. So anyone who wants this job needs to register on our, on our web page and send us something. Uh, you know, the job application. Uh, so, well, by the book, uh, first we're creating a, and now use your imagination if you don't see all the lines, but I I'll guide you to this. Um, so first f uh, we're creating our algebra, right? So our abstract semantics that we want to have in, in the language we'll be, we'll be building programs in. So. What, what are we gonna do? We're gonna save applications, update applications, remove applications, and check pins. Well, imagine that uh, there is some kind of a security pin that's generated and sent to, to your email that you need to check afterwards if, if you're authorized to add, uh, change the application or remove it afterwards. So we have some kind of a business logic that we will just expose, I guess that's the right word, in this, in this algebra. And this algebra has all the things that uh, they are needed for uh, for it to be used as a free, namely, it's a higher kind of type. And, um, well, as a, yeah, yeah, keep in your memory that, you know, all these, all these actions are there. And uh, we code here, or we hide in the signature here, the things that we want to return once these actions are, are executed. So that's how we code our, our business logic. So uh, say, you know what, I can press enter probably somewhere right here. All right, so um, if, say, we want to check your PIN, given your email and your PIN number, your alleged PIN number, then we want to return Boolean if it's okay or not. So here we code the result, and here we code, uh, you know, we pass the, the things or the, the bits of data needed for, for execution, and so on, so on. So if we want to, you know, save your applications and we get some kind of a request, and we return either error or, uh, and an instance of your job applications, and so on, so on, so on. So here we're just taking care of uh, of the first part of uh, of all of these five points uh, that I outlined, uh, you know, seconds before. So we coded our, or we we found a representation in terms of algebra or DSL, if you will, of our business logic, and. Basically, what we have here is a we're building our metaphor of program. So, the free of this algebra producing a result of type A is our program, and we have more complicated program like exceptional program or oh yeah, exception is the right word. The program that can uh, that can throw exceptions, which uh, just takes a program and wraps it in XORT. So that's the point of the, you know that's this building of of these internal DSLs that will that will expose the program metaphor for us, hiding the, the unimportant details. And also that uh, shows how you can, you know, wrap in uh, or use monad transformers to wrap, uh, wrap free to create additional semantics, uh, executional semantics. I have a question. Yeah, yeah, sure. In, in program, uh, uh, yeah, so it's, it's a, no, no, no. yeah, it's a simple, you know, algebraic data type object. Let me finish. Yeah. Uh -huh. How does it correspond to the other error inside the action? Uh, does the error in action save application show up on the left or on the right side of the sort? Well, uh, so ask sort t once, it's the left part and this is right part because that's how sort t is uh, interprets its uh, its positional type parameters. So if save application action yields uh, left, containing an error, it will be somehow moved to the left side of the, this other XOR? Uh, what's the other XOR? This one? No, the other one, I mean the, the lower one in XOR T. I'm not sure if I, if I get the, the question. Uh, I'll, I'll try to answer it anyway. <laughs> Uh, just, just you know, stop me when I when I when I am saying uh, you know things that you you're not asking for. So, XOR T is a way of saying that if you have a program that returns XOR in forms of error XOR A, which we have right here, then it can behave as if the XOR is not there, right? Because that's XOR transformer, and 
if it uh, encounters left of type error, left holding an error, it will just bail out, and if not, it will continue to uh, well process or to execute further things. So these are the semantics of XORT, and XORT works with things returning XOR, obviously. So this thing will need to return XOR, and some of our things do return XOR. Yeah, yeah, some of them, but not all. Yeah, so you can't use, or you can't use easily, say, check pin for this, but XORT, uh, I will show it to you here, all right? So, but let me just place some enters, and uh, it, it's going to become... It's going to become clear, I guess. Uh, and I will put enter here. So say, if I have an action returning error or whatever, say, save application is the right kind of action, I can just wrap it into XOR, call it execute or fail, and be done with it. XOR T will take care of, you know, carrying out execution uh, as, as its semantics are. But if I have, say, uh, check pin, and I want to, which doesn't return XOR, then I will have compile time error because the types won't match. But XORT has all these fancy constructors which I can use. Say, uh, oh, let's, le all right, let's, let me take this one. All right, so say, if I have an action that doesn't return XOR, then I can say that this action will be always right. Well, that's arbitrary choice. I can say it's al always left, but well, given the semantics, it's it's uh, it's usual to have it uh, have it, you know, always right. Mm -hmm. So, if I say when I use check pin in program X context, I will use a execute right method, which will transform the result of this boolean right here into right boolean. And the whole action will become a XOR something action, which then is appropriate for XOR T transformer. All right. So I can, it boils down to things. I can either use action which has appropriate result, which is XOR, because I use XOR T, and then I can use it as is, just wrap it in XOR T constructor, mm -hmm. or if I do not have the right type within simple A, then I can use some, uh, you know, fancy XOR T constructors, like pretend it's always right, mm -hmm. okay? So I have various ways of, of creating a XOR, uh, XOR T out of, out of simple action. And we were talking about the second point of my five-point list, which is this internal metaphor of program. So these details that I was explaining, like uh, whether to use XOR T write and XOR T execute action, they are fun to discuss, and uh, thanks for the question, by the way. But uh, they kind of they kind of help all these program metaphors. So we want to write them once and for all. At least that's what I'm doing, and wrap them in methods called execute or fail. Well, names are not important. I mean, you can come up with your own, but well, I found it good to be following this this execution program semantics and so on metaphor. So. I'm wrapping this into execute returns. Uh, returns is simply pure, right? But what does pure mean? You need to know what free is to have any notion of what pure is. But if you write a program in a, you know, in a, in a business logic settings and you see a returns value, then your intuition probably will tell you what that is. Uh, same goes for fail, for execute, for execute or fail, for execute write, and so on, so on. If you don't like my names, just come up with your own, but just do come up with any. Uh, I, I found it very helpful for you know maintaining this, uh, maintaining this, um, this well program metaphor. All right, so here in this uh, you know uh, thirty lines of code, we uh, we created a uh, business logic and some kind of an internal metaphor uh, of, uh, well, 
of execution this program and now let's write our first program and let me place you know enters here under say very simple program how do we apply for a job given uh, some kind of application request where well you might imagine you know someone sends us someone sends us something email full name whatnot so we create a program, right? We validate request, and if this validation comes up right, we uh, sorry left, we'll just fail with some error. Here goes the program metaphor. If it's right, then we will execute a single instruction. That's a very simple program. At the end of this method, this description of this program, how to apply for a job, will uh, will contain just one instruction, be it a this one or this one. But there are more complicated programs. Uh, of course, you can, you know, break it down if you want to. Safe application can be broken down into, into smaller parts, but just, you know, for the sake of purpose, it's, it's enough. But we can write more, uh, you know, involved programs or more, uh, you know, sophisticated sorts of programs. All right, so I, I'll just go through this one, and that's... <laughs> That's the end. Well, we can talk later about it uh, during after party or so on. Woo! Go back. Um, all right, so a more complicated program goes like this. So we have an update application program which will take up my email, my PIN, and my uh, request where, where the data, data is passed. So I will use a for comprehension for this. Just one more. All right. Now it's not so pretty formatted, but at least you can see, you know, all the bits and pieces. Um, yeah, so that's a more complicated program. It will create, it will, you know, at the end of its uh, of this this flat map, uh, it will contain at least few instructions. So we just code it in simply abstract terms that we wanna validate a request. That's one instruction. Then we wanna check pin. That's the other instruction. And if the pin is correct, that's the boolean that this action will produce. If the pin is correct, we want another abstract action that's update application, or we will produce a, a uh, final value that's incorrect pin. Now, all the executional semantics are you know, off the picture. Here we have the pure logic of how update application works. So validate request check pin if correct, and so on, so on, so on. But we don't want to carry, you know, uh, carry on if something is wrong along the way. So if we, if we didn't validate a request, we wanna, we wanna bail out. We don't want to carry out execution. If the pin doesn't come right, we wanna throw exception, which is XOR in our settings, and so on, so on. But we do not want to code this logic of, you know, failing, throwing, catching, or whatnot. Whatever, whatever the name for this is. We just want a simple linear logic, so we used our, uh, our XORT wrapper. So all the things uh, concerned with you know, finishing execution on errors are hidden in XORT, which is a part of CATS or well, Scala Z as well, and so on, so on. Here we have a just a, a just a simple linear, so to say, a bit more apart of this if, a linear description of logic. Well, distilled, if you will. I guess my time is up. Do you want to see a HTTP resource for this? Yeah. All right. All right. All right. That's that's probably too much. That would be yes. Did someone say yes? <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, yeah. Okay. We can we can finish it. Uh, you know, uh, during after party, if you want to. But as I said, HTTP resource will just take this program and call it with appropriate arguments and with appropriate interpreters. You know, e e maybe maybe later on we can talk about. So is this code on GitHub? Uh, it is on GitLab, our internal, but it will be on GitHub soon. Because we're uh, we're actually, well, we have been writing a blog post about it, 
it, it, it took a while because you know it's our it's our first book that we just started out and uh, it, it took a while but uh, we were really ready to let it out so it, it's gonna be soon online so yes if you want to then you know add it please if you if you check that thank you thank you